It's a real privilege and honor today to introduce you to Dr. Christopher Horsey. Um, I have recently had uh, the honor to begin to work on a project with Christopher, and so we just had a meeting yesterday afternoon. Uh, Christopher has a, a long background in economic development, and he's been working with the Tanaha Nation Council since 1994. We did the quick math on that. We believe it's 23 years. Christopher has also been working for some time now with Selkirk College and College of the Rockies, the two colleges that occupy the traditional territories here of many nations, and also working with Gonzaga University, south of us in Spokane, Washington. The nature of Christopher's research is refining the Indigenous voice in research and balancing Western scientific research with Indigenous worldviews, helping people to play nicely with one another. It's my pleasure to give you Christopher. Can move this around a little bit because I tend to talk a little bit loud uh, and I don't like to get too close to the microphone but uh, this seems to be that seems to be a good level there um, I'm, I'm really happy to be here today uh, this is an area part of the world that uh, my community my family uh, is uh, proud to call its traditional territory or what we would say is and even today walking through Nelson just looking at some of the artwork and seeing the people and, and just being able to uh, be a part of this community and, and, and spend time here uh, is a really great thing. I've spent more time in Nelson in the last year or so than I have probably in my first uh, 40 years. Uh, and it's a place that I've found to be increasingly uh, important. That there is this great confluence of people that um, eat different foods and have different diets and uh, dress differently and have different backgrounds and everybody tolerates each other, which is really nice uh, because I've also lived in places where that's not the case. Um, you don't like that food, you don't eat here. You, know, you don't talk this language, you don't work here. Uh, you don't want to play by our rules and you're a participant and at any time that participation um, could end. So um, it's a really, I think, fitting venue for what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, I hope it's interesting to you. At the end, I hope you have uh, questions and answers, although sometimes there's no questions. Uh, and sometimes I, people feel bad and sometimes people cry. Um, I, I'm trying to have a really positive at the end because I don't want people to feel like that. But at the same time, um, what's happened to my community and our collective voice is, is a really difficult story. Um, the focus of the presentation today should really be this idea of a new place for our voice and this idea of reconciliation and Canada 150 and all of these things we're celebrating. But at the end of the day, there are indigenous people that see people at concerts wearing fake headdresses and kids that dress up in costumes as indigenous people when our communities weren't even allowed to do that. Um, people that want to use our images and want to use um, our language and introductions and videos and, and things like that, we were actually not allowed to speak our language for quite some time. And um, you can't talk about moving forward and you can't talk about the role of indigenous people and indigenous knowledge and triangulating data and triangulating research and working together uh, for a more sustainable outcome unless we are at least a little bit honest about what's happening. Where we have been in the last couple of years in our community is focusing on moving forward. How do we understand that not everything that's happened to us has to drive or impact or bias every decision that we make? But at the same time, we've got to be very honest about it. There were just some brutally crushing things that happened. But we also know that we want a voice today in research and curriculum and academia and science and all of those things. And we want to be a part of this world that moves forward that says there's one resource set for everyone on this planet, for everyone. There's one resource set 
until we successfully make it to another planet and mess that planet up, there's one set. So how do we get everybody's voices and opinions and perspectives into the discussion early? So that when things get tough, when pressures are difficult, that there aren't these fissures that kind of develop and tear things apart. How do we make sure that this conversation we start today is still a conversation that we can have a year from now or a decade from now, or the way my community looks at it a generation from now when my daughter and her peers are in this place and looking forward. So my little introduction slide here is mostly meant to be a little bit funny. <laughs> reconciliation in the age of reconciliation. Uh, everybody always wants to talk about reconciliation and from our perspective, reconciliation is kind of a Canadian thing. It's not really an us thing. Um, when people started talking about truth and reconciliation, everybody looked at us to lead that discussion and we said, we're the ones that are supposed to hear this formal apology. Um, we, we can't tell you how to do that and we can't coach you on that and we don't really have the appropriate background to kind of lead you into that. That's a thing that has to come from you and we're always going to be here. We've been here for 13,000 years. We're always going to be here and we're always going to be willing to have that conversation. It might not be easy. Um, but the idea of reconciliation in the age of reconciliation, I think as I talk a little bit more, you'll understand where that comes from. Primarily, I work for the Kunaka Nation Council. I've been a consultant for the Nation Council since 94. All of the Rockies, I'm the indigenous uh, instructor, uh, indigenous uh, scholar in residence, I'm a curriculum developer, and a co instructor on different projects at Selkirk here locally. I work with the Lower Kootenai Band, Union Institute, University, American Indian Business Leaders, Eastern Washington, it goes on and on. I've got like 20 different clients. Uh, and I'm just at the end of a really long two weeks on the road, so as soon as I'm done here, I get to drive home and hang out uh, with my family. So, um, a few topics for today. I'm going to talk generally about culture, um, the idea of epistemology, the role of conversation, because that's something that's really different in my community, especially when we talk about research and conversations of weight. The way that we communicate is different in a few really important ways. This idea of reconciliation, or in my community, what we would say is thinking with one heart or solving a problem with one heart or having a conversation where we're all on the same page. Uh, and then at the end, I have, um, I really like to use images. I like to use pictures. We've got a bunch of great pictures, of some rural community building in our community. In some cases, that's happening in places where we haven't always been invited to be there. And in some cases, it took us using our voice saying enough. I don't care if there's a fence there. And I don't care if you come and told me that I have to have a status card or a pedigree paper to be here. We're coming here as a group. We're using our voice. We're using these resources. We're outside of the city limits. <laughs> We're going to do what's appropriate. Um, and then at the end, uh, there's some great pictures of a few ongoing projects. So to begin, who, who am I? Um, who is Horse Thief? Uh, that's kind of my nickname in the communities. The kids in one of our communities call me the devil as well. My wife speculates it's because of my facial hair, but my daughter one time said, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe you're just mean to everyone. You don't smile. Um, my name uh, is, uh, is actually Nighthawk. Um, it, in our language, is the only word that starts with that adjective, aspirated P. Um, so I, it's kind of cool. My name is the only word in our language that starts with that little P with an apostrophe above it. And that name came from my grandfather. Um, in English, literally, Kustata is Christopher, and the I, Ashkazin, is the one that steals the horses. And people always ask, especially um, in an international setting, that sounds like it's a negative connotation. But in our community, to be able to go, our economies were based off of horses. The more horses you had, the more you could do, the more people you could help, the more stable you were in the face of danger or uh, crisis or natural disaster. Um, and also being able to outsmart someone to take their horse and get away uh, was a really big thing. I had a relative named White Cloud that was really good at it. He was so good at it that when they caught him in Southern Alberta, they memorialized his body in stone. 
uh, is still an archaeological site there. Um, I don't go to that area, and I don't care to really go and see it. I've also said here that my grandfather is from uh, Kiskno, which is the uh, used to be called the Columbia Lake Indian Band. My land, my people's little plot of land, um, is actually the little creek that flows out of Columbia Lake, where you can tiptoe across the Columbia River. And in the summers, like the very dry ones that we just had, you can actually walk on rocks and just hop across the river without getting your feet wet. So when I work with tribes that are down the river, it's always one of those things because they are going down and it's this massive, huge, mile-wide thing. Um, we're from, my, my grandfather's from the place where that's just basically a tiny little creek. And right down the road, what used to be called uh, the St. Mary's Indian Preserve is at um, and that's where my grandmother was from. And um, I like to talk about them because the story kind of starts there. So these are my grandparents. This is Louis Paul. This was Nighthawk. And his wife, Gertrude Gonzaga, um, no relation to Gonzaga University. I know because I used to make the joke that I should get free tuition. <laughs> and they said, no, uh, that didn't work. Um, this is Sam Gonzaga. Sam Gonzaga was one of the last people in our communities. Uh, he was one of the first people to um, have children removed. He was right on that cusp of the residential school showing up. Um, some of his older uh, siblings and some of his older children didn't have to go to the residential schools and the younger ones did. My grandparents, his daughter here, uh, Gertrude and Louis Paul, their oldest four kids went to the residential school. It wasn't an option. They didn't send them to school like I hope to send my daughter to college. Um, they didn't send them there for a better life. They were told by the Indian agent, if you don't send your child here for 11 months of the year, you will go to jail. It's not an option. It's compulsory. Um, you don't get to decide you're not sending your kids. And at some point, when they had the three youngest kids, they left. <coughs> they packed everything up in the middle of the night. And in mid-1950s Canada, they became refugees from Canada. So let that sink in for a minute. People like to think that Canada is this place where we do all these really great progressive things, but the reality is since the Geneva Conven Convention, everybody knew you don't take kids for the express reason of changing a culture. But Canada was doing that until the 80s. And my grandparents said enough. And they packed up their three little babies and they ended up in Washington State. And they ended up being a part of a rural agricultural community that I later worked in and then as a graduate student go back I got to go back and do some uh, agricultural economics research. And it was really beautiful because when I would be interviewing these producers, they would say, um, you know, wh where did you grow up? And I would tell them, I said, yeah, but my, my first jobs, I would, I would pick berries. Uh, I spent my summers in the fields and they would want to know where, and I would tell them uh, which place where I would pick strawberries and then move to raspberries and then move to blueberries and then to pumpkins and then to squash. And they knew all of those operators. And then they would say, you know what, come on in. I had no idea who you were, but there's something now about you that I identify with. I'll, I'll give you an interview. And these are people that didn't always like doing interviews. If you work with farmers, they're not always really super stoked <laughs> to see people showing up at their house asking questions. And I spent uh, about a year with um, dairy farmers and potato farmers and seed farmers. And one of the things that was really interesting is they would say, after World War II for about 15 years, before our uh, migrant workers were primarily Braceros, they were indigenous people from the interior of BC, and we didn't know what was happening, but they showed up by the thousands. And I told them what was happening is they were losing their children. My father and his two sisters, those three youngest, uh, ended up in foster care eventually, but they ended up in foster care together. And one of their longer foster parents just passed away. Seven individuals is not a really strong statistical sample, but my four, uh, well, three uncles and one aunt that went to the residential school all died before I had a chance to meet them. Self-destructed over time. I never met them. I never met my grandparents. <clears throat> I was given my grandfather's name because that's the tradition. The oldest of the kids, uh, the oldest of the male kids from that generation would have the grandfather's name. And they gave me his name and they said, we know you never knew him. We know you never met your grandmother.
but this name will help you be a part of him and carry on that part of your family. So I'm always really proud and really happy today that I can tell people that, that that's a really old name. Unfortunately for my wife, the, you know, if you know the Nighthawk, that little owl, um, it never builds a nest, never stays in the same place two nights in a row. It's always on the move. So I told that to my wife and she said, wait, what? And I said, yeah, I'm gonna drive a lot and I'm always gonna be on the road. That's my name, that's who I am. Um, hence my being on the road for 12 of the last 14 days or whatever it has been. The three youngest are all still alive and they're functional and they're my relatives and I love them and I have relationships with them and I get to see them and I get to interact with them. Something horrific had to be happening and the lives of those four oldest that went to the residential school um, that was dramatically different from even being in foster care, which wasn't a picnic, I'm not saying it was great, but they were together. Somehow we're able to maintain that sense of identity. And this is my father over here on the end, my father and my, my younger brother, Mike. Uh, if you're around tomorrow in Cranbrook on your way through, there's a powwow where Mike is the MC. Uh, you can stop by there. I also understand I think that there's a possibility of going to Ainsworth tomorrow. I should have some pictures of Ainsworth. Yeah. Either of those would be great trips. The nice thing about this picture is my grandfather, those floral designs that he has on his outfit are the same floral designs that are on my outfit. From a very young age, I knew that even if I didn't know my grandparents, there were things that I were going to do like they did. They were on the road, they were moving, they lived in rural communities where they could pick up and move when they needed to, when they were in danger of having their children taken, where they could go and they could follow the work and they could live this semi-nomadic lifestyle and people are still really proud of that. Up until the 1960s, that agricultural group would travel to uh, West Fisher and they would pick all day and they would gamble and play stick game all night and if you won, you didn't have to get up as early and work as hard the next day. Of course, if you lost, <laughs> that was not the case. They would go from there to Kettle Falls. They'd go from there to Yakima. They were a part of this thing where we started to see that indigenous people that would sing these very old songs started sharing them. So when young people like myself would go to a powwow, I'd hear a song and someone would say, hey, that was your uncle's song. And someone else would say, that's a song from Northern Alberta. And someone else would say, no, no, that's a song from Umatilla. And then we started to realize as young people, something really different happened in the last generation. The way that we connected, the way that we shared, the way that we had these experiences together was very different from anything that happened probably before 150, 200 years ago. And now I get to be this person that gets to make a decision and decide what I want to pass on to my daughter. Um, I did a TED talk here for Selkirk College. It has to be reformatted. We're waiting for it to be up. If you want to understand a little bit more about parenting post-colonization and understanding that my dad didn't have tools to give me to be a father because he didn't get tools from his father, because his father didn't get tools from his father and so on and so forth for about 120 years, it's worth watching. Um, the other thing, uh, Jocelyn was diagnosed with Asperger's and um, Jocelyn and I uh, have got a chance to work on a lot of really great projects together. Because I'm a little bit socially awkward, if you notice, I sit outside in my headphones and I try and be in my own little world and work on my own little thing. And at the end here, I'm probably not gonna hang out and do the restaurant crawl kind of thing like you did last night. But for somebody who served in the military and been to graduate school and worked in all these different places um, and has a PhD in leadership and can go and study human organizational systems and organizational theory and information sharing and problem solving networks. I met Jocelyn when she was eight because technically she's my stepdaughter and everything changed. You can't tell somebody with Asperger's that they're going to do it differently. You can't tell them why you feel a certain way. I can't tell her that she's going to change her behavior. Input output mechanisms are completely different and I learned more about sharing information and problem solving networks from her than I did any textbook ever. And I'm, I'm one of those science guys. I wrote a paper for MIT. I, I wrote a 400 page quantitative dissertation. And here I was with this little beautiful tiny human being whose brain was completely different than a lot of people's, but also the same as mine in many ways. And 
I got to start working with my father who came back into my life and was a really big part of Jocelyn's life. And I got to see all of these things fixing themselves. I got to see my father being a father like he didn't get to be to me. I remember one time we were boating and I woke up and I couldn't find either of them and I panicked because I thought they had somehow fallen off the boat and whatever, they were out swimming, not wearing life vests, of course, so they got both of them in trouble. <laughs> and I yelled at them to come back to the boat and what do you think they did? The other direction and I got to watch, I'd never seen my father swim before. I didn't know he could swim, I always figured if he jumped in the water he was gonna sink. But here, lo and behold, my daughter and my father um, doing these really amazing things, having these experiences, being kind of a part of this, making a family uh, really essentially after the collapse of everything. Also, we compete on Instagram. You saw me taking a few pictures. She's got way more friends than I do, but I think I have better pictures. At least I take more pictures uh, of other people. Um, so, <laughs> and I used to have a picture of her going like this because every picture I tried to take, she'd have ghost hand, where it was like, Shh. she didn't want me to take any pictures. But if I give her the camera, she loves to take pictures of us going out to dinner. Doesn't want me to take a picture of her. I give her the camera. Me in the background, her in the foreground, smiling, getting into whatever kind of trouble we do, whatever restaurants we tend to be at. So culture is this process. I love Edgar Schein's work where he talks about culture as being uh, this uh, shared system of values that tell us what's acceptable. They tell us how to get along with one another. Uh, they integrate uh, social behavior. They provide stability by removing some of the uncertainty in the, in the world around us. There are patterns, and if patterns work and they help you do things together, they're not as hard as doing them on your own, and there's something that's good about them and passing them on. You will also say that history is the residue of uh, the leadership process, because if an idea is good, it worked, and you stay with that idea. If there's a better idea, and someone proposes it, that idea is better, then that becomes that new decision it becomes a part of history. And if there are worse ideas, you find that you get a new idea that you move away from, either going back to your work or something that works better. Culture is this great thing that allows us to create a coherent narrative, and that's gonna be really important with, with, with what I'm talking about. It helps you to arrange your experiences in such a way that you can tell a story that you can relate to. I know who I am because these are my experiences. And each one of those experiences has given me something to make sense of the world. They help me to create this kind of uh, coherence uh, with myself and who I interact with. And when we have a group that does that together, you get community. For us, for enough of people, that's happened for 13,000 years in this little valley and the next valley over and maybe for 100 miles uh, by maybe 30 or 40 miles. We've used those materials for about 13,000 years. We've defined, we've decided what's worked and we've passed them on and we've helped to solve problems and work together. And literally for us, we break that down into uh, and I like to use my language because not a lot of people hear it. We're a really small group and there's not a lot of people that speak it. We're a linguistic isolate um, and it's a language that isn't heard very often. So I like to say this. It's literally the sounds that we make to one another. That's what it means. That's our language. That's one of our most important tools. Uh, uh, the whole collection of all the protocols so that I know a little bit about you and I know this is what you like or don't like in communicating and I'm looking at something, maybe a, a logo that someone is wearing and I, might, I saw a lot of architects in here. I see a lot of this kind of material. There are things that I know about that. There are things I recognize about. All of those things that help to coordinate what we might do. I spent yesterday walking from skate shop to skate shop looking for a skull skate sweatshirt because you can't get those in the States. So there are these little things that I'm signaling to you, you're signaling to me, I'm remembering them. Uh, I'll remember that we were at this event and there are certain things that rural issues are important to you. How can we it? All the things like that that you remember that help us to solve problems together. Um, uh, this is a tough one. Uh, and literally the old ladies would say that's like our fairy tales. But what it means is stories when animals were the people. All of those creation stories. Why we treat people a certain way. Why this tribe is a certain way that's different from us. 
why we don't steal, why we care for people that are visiting in our area like they were our own, why every mountain has the name that it has, why this lake that we're on the shores of has the name that it does. Those are all from these stories that forever either had to be translated into English or just remembered and never shared because we weren't allowed to give these ideas and share them between one another. And then it's just way done. Lately, the big buzzword was indigenous ways of knowing, indigenous ways of being, indigenous ways of this, that, and the other thing. It's just way done. All of our words for learning have to do with ishwi. Uh, ishwi is our heart. Do that. Take your hand and kind of point down and hit your sternum. You hear that below 200 hertz, that thud in there? All that's for us, that's our heart. Uh, when those old ladies tell you that, uh, I would be telling you, concentrate, try really hard. Um, all of these words for us that have to do with learning don't have anything to do with our heads. For us, learning is fundamentally about our heart. All of those words that have to do with learning do not have them, nothing to do with your head. It's all about your heart. You can hear it once or twice, but until you accept it and it's this part of what you do, enough for it to become this reaction that you have, this phenomenological foundation, this idea that will never be outside of your heart, then it's not really something um, that you learned. So think about it. I love this picture. Um, this, this boy, not just because he looks super excited to be a young man on a horse, but look at this old lady back here who's got two of her grandkids. I heard that it was common for her to have three or four grandkids on a horse with her. <laughs> think about all of the, how many people have been on a horse? How many people have been on a horse with one other person? Two other people. How many people have stole a horse? <laughs> think about all of the ideas and all of the history and all of the experiences that have to be encoded and remembered and explicitly passed on so that you know as two young or three young kids could be on there with your grandmother don't grab the mane don't pull the ear don't stand right behind it and slap it don't kick it here don't make a sudden noise there there are generations of knowledge about the tools that you have that help you to be able to do things like this. Culture is the process of going from the explicit to the implicit. These kids will know that. And the few Dunaha horsemen that we have left today, that's their life, that's their purpose, that's their identity. And they remember these things and they bring these stories back and they share those and they'll tell and they get, it's just a, it's a beautiful thing to see. But culture is that process of moving from the explicit to the implicit. This is the Sturgeon Nose Canoe. This is the one of two places on the planet that these canoes came from. I was really disappointed. I saw a picture of a canoe on a building up in town and they took the Kalispell tribe's blunt nose version so close but so far. That's a different tribe from another place on a different waterway system. We know them, those are our friends. We know the differences between our canoes and their canoes. The ones here from this lake would have a completely pointed end. We still make these with our kids. A lot of the other groups around here quit making them for a long time. We've never stopped making them. We have camps where we get kids together and we cut down the cedar, we split the cedar and we cut it down and we shape each rib where we go out and we take the maple saplings at the right time and then we strip them down and cut them, we split them, we shape them, we put them in water, we leave them in water till they're pliable, we bend them into hoops, we get kids with their hands on the hoops building these. And when you hear that crack, like you hear and you know you've broken one of your ribs, your rings, and it echoes through the gym, all those kids stop and they all look like they're in trouble. And we tell them, hey, it's opening, it's okay, it's good. We're gonna go get more maple. So they start getting things ready to go get in the truck to go wherever and we tell them, waha, ah, it's not. Go out that back door, walk 50 feet, tell me what you see. Everything we need to make these canoes grows within a stone's throw of that building. The bitter cherry that we use for the strapping to tie things together are out the front door. If you've been to the Yanukki Powwow, the Creston, and you've been in that parking lot, right on the other side of the parking lot from the building is our bitter cherry. We still use that when we build these canoes. 
the cedar root that you can, it's the cordage, you just kick the ground until you see it and you pull it up and you can get five or six meters up. And it's strong, it's as strong as wire. All of those things, we just teach the kids. This is where it comes from. I love this picture because this man has done that with his kids since the beginning of time. He's just that next link in the chain. His kids aren't at the residential school. His kids aren't in care. They haven't been taken away from him. And I can guarantee you when the agent shows up, they jump in the canoe with the kids and they take the kids on the run. It was really common, especially at Lower Kootenai, because this was their station wagon. And you could flip it over and get the entire family. And there's always a dog. There's always, all those old pictures, there's always a dog. When the agents would come in for the kids, the, the old ladies would say enough and they'd grab their kids and they'd jump on the canoe and they would head out. They knew that the nose of this canoe is like the sturgeon because the sturgeon is one of those fish that can get by where there's a lot of vegetation in the water. This canoe cuts through that swampy land that other people don't like to bring their Coleman canoes and their kind of flat bottom rigs and whatnot. Culture is this way of preserving your identity across space and time. Something challenges you, something goes away, some resource is hard to find. You have a set of rules that probably came from a coyote story about how he wasted something and then the community had to find a replacement or find a way to work without it for a short period of time. The songs that we sing about one of my favorite stories, and I'm not telling you this because I want you to go and tell anyone else, but this is one of those realizations that we came to. We have a story about where Coyote was mistreating women and he mistreated them often. And uh, there were um, people from the water here and they told him, you come and spend time with us and you party with us and you're gonna have a really good time. And there's a song and they sang the song with him. They latched arm in arm and they were walking around and singing and Coyote thought he was just gonna have this fun time with these women because that's the way he felt. He died over and over and over again to tell us something that was good. Those women were mermaids and they danced him down into the water and killed him for doing that. But then we went through this process where people wanted to clean up or fix or sterilize our things because the sisters and the priests didn't like that. So those teachings went away. What impact do you think that had on the way that we view women in our community? The way that young boys should look at young girls as being a part of their world had a really catastrophic impact but this is one of those this was one of the last times where our community got together to pray like this to sing these songs and our songs don't always have words in them they have these deep meanings every time we sing them even if i've heard them a million times some of them i've heard thousands of times you hear it and someone will always give the speech this is the canoe song because the canoe will always take you where you need to go no matter how far, and it will always be safe. The number of songs and the number of stories about crossing Kootenai Lake on canoe and where you can and where you can't and the conditions of the water for you to make it safely across, there's, I know at least a dozen stories, and at some point in our history, there were probably 100. If you can't shoot an arrow from 100 meters away and hit your target, the water's too rough, because as soon as you move into an area where it's deep enough, you're going to swamp. And we have people still that don't listen to those stories, but they think they got it. They think they're going to do it. And they're the ones who come safe. They're the ones that don't make it. Epistemology is that idea that what we know represents something. It's how we know what we know. It came from somewhere. Um, I mentioned earlier that idea uh, about um, kind of deep structures and having these great ideas and having these kinds of things that give us this leadership. Uh, they give us these directions. Um, it, it's how we know what we know, and these are the modes and methods of learning. Why do I know not to cross the river if it's moving that fast? Well, I know because maybe there's a story, or maybe uh, it just looks dangerous, or maybe someone has told me or given me some specialized knowledge. For us, this gets way done, um, is the process of going from a this way mom of not being wise to being uh, to, to, to not know, to knowing. So we've heard coyote stories and we've heard people tell us why to do it or how not to do it. And we've watched people do it. And we just, at some point, because of the way we interact with the community, 
we see how that works and that makes sense to us. Um, it's how we build the world around us. It's how when I talk to my daughter, she's not to the point where she goes and she shops for herself or she does her own budget. But one of our traditional beliefs is that young people, while they're teenagers, move, uh, they kind of progress through these stages where they will start providing a little bit more of the resources until someday she can provide all the resources that she needs. So her kinds of chores are things like also, in addition to cleaning your room and feeding the dog, which she does not always do those 100% of the time. When we go shopping, you do not plan to do something different because your mother will give you a list of things that the house needs. There are certain things that you need, and then there are things that we get together. And your job is to remember the things that are specific to you, and the things that are specific to your mother, and the things that are on this list. And if you forget, I'm not going to save you. If you forget, then the family's going to go without. And you go through that process, and one time I took a bunch of people who went shopping. She knows I'm always doing the experiments. <laughs> she knows I was taking pictures of her, um, she has her own little cart. She likes the tall one that's short because it's easier for her to move. She's got her own little cart and she's just happy, the happiest I've ever seen her. Purpose, identity, belonging, right? It's, it's something that means something. She remembered everything on the list she was supposed to get for her mother and everything I was supposed to get. A hundred years ago, if she was a berry basket maker, um, if she was making um, our silverware, if she was making some part of our bow or our arrow or the arrow shaft, or she was the arrow strap shaft straightener, or she was the person that made our tooling mats, whatever it is, she would start in this apprenticeship and move to the point where at the end she becomes the expert. And seeing her today, just as happy as how many kids go grocery shopping and they're happy. I've just shown her, there's this way, there's this, and we would tell them the story. And the other thing is, um, my good friend, I, I'm, I'm actually the right hand of the chief of the Lower Kubi Band. His name is Jason Louie. He's in Ainsworth right now with some other chiefs. Um, the Lower Kubi Band recently purchased Ainsworth and is dedicated to having this really great facility with world-class food and these really, she knows Jason and she also knows that Jason has three daughters that are just older than her. So a lot of the stories are, I get the opportunity to learn what Jason learned and I get to pass those to her, and it becomes this really functional part of her developing this identity, this sense of belonging. So George Tinker, who is an indigenous scholar, wrote about these things in terms of deep structures. This is where you negotiate your meaning. This is where you develop your identity as a group, as an individual. The way I related to my father was not really great because my father didn't have a way to relate to his. But at some point after I moved back here, all of those old ladies saw something in me where they were able to say, you know what? I'll be your grandmother, I'll be your grandfather, I'll be, I will pass these things to you as long as you just hold them long enough for them to be a part of who you are. They're a part of that, 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 that belonging, that idea. We'll tell you the stories, we'll give you the names, we'll teach you the words because nothing is random. No language is random. They're goal-directed, they're purpose-driven. Every new word that we make isn't some crazy word that we just make up because it sounds mean. My example is Cranbrook. What does Cranbrook mean? Nobody knows. Cranbrook was named after a little city in England somewhere. Nobody's been there. Nobody cares. What is it in Kunaha? There's, uh, there's a whole bunch of names for all of the different parts. That hill where the golf course is is literally called where we throw things away because it used to be the dump. <laughs> Sorry, that's the uh, Kinmi. The powwow this weekend at College of the Rockies is called the uh, Kinmi powwow because that's literally a pile of arrows. That's the story we have for that place. After all those animals were kicked out after this big war, the last two that were left um, were, uh, who were they? They were uh, the, the flying squirrel and the bat. And what's special about those two animals? Those are the two animals that can fly, or at least glide, that don't have feathers. Because after this battle, they were told, we're gonna have the best feathers for you. And they were a little bit greedy and they kept waiting for an even better set. So all the animals got all of the feathers. And at the end, they said, we're sorry. We, 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 we meant to give you the first set, but you didn't want them, you were a little bit greedy. So they had to figure out how to get down. So they tied blankets on them and they learned how to glide. Uh, Kim, if you go to that powwow, you will always know what that mountain in Cranbrook means. That's a key way. That's our geography. That's the way we tell where we're going. It's one of those places. 
Also the suckerfish, and if you know what's the, the suckerfish has got the big bulged out eyes. Suckerfish didn't get a blanket, he just chopped it when he hit the ground. His eyes popped out. <laughs> All of the ways that you take those kinds of stories and give them to people to carry on, <coughs> that help them to build a part of this world. That's this idea of, of, for us, our epistemology. And for us, it comes from our language. But those deep structures for us are our language, our family, our history, traditions, philosophies, morals, ethics, collective memories, uh, what people call indigenous ways of knowing, our ceremonial events, all of those things that tie us to the collective. This is a family, this is three generations of a family working together, teaching and passing information on the way they would have since the beginning of time. They're not using the old style Nahik Nana, they're actually picking fruit in the Creston Valley using one of those flats they used to use. But we have a baby with grandmother. Her only job at this age is to listen and just watch her grandmother and be happy. Then that next group of kids, she's stealing berries. I don't know if you can see it, but she's stealing out of that. Her only job is to start listening and decide what it is she likes to do so she can be kind of placed into an apprenticeship where she gets a mentor that will teach her there's some propensity, there's some willingness, there's some thing that she's good at. And the community builds her into that. Here's a song that goes with that. There's a song called Naikana about building berry baskets. That's a song for people that have that job. There was a time in our community where every one of the hundreds of jobs we ever had had this specialized knowledge that help you develop a sense of purpose. They, they helped that narrative make sense for you. They helped you to understand your place in the world. They gave you that sense of belonging. After you go through that process of being a teenager and you've done your apprenticeship and now you're the expert, now you can have children, now you can have your family. Now you get to be a mentor to someone else, and you move to that next group. And then after that, you become an elder, and your only job is to retell those stories. That's the way that it works. I just love this picture. Here's an example. Researchers used to come in and say, you know what, we're uh, biologists, and we are here to study the way you organize fish. Uh, but we want you to use uh, Latin and genus and species and all, because that's the real way, that's the formal way, that's the centralized way, that's the official way, that's the scientific way. And the old people would say, you're asking the very end question and you're missing all of the beginning questions. Because for us, we have and then we have seven families or seven groups. And each of those groups is not random. It's purpose-driven, it's goal-directed. We have the animals that um, have webbed feet. There's something important about them. And then, of course, the researchers would say, oh, that's really quaint. Do you know that in this species, that's their name that way because they're webbed feet? And we were like, oh, but what about all the other animals with webbed feet? And they would say, well, we have different names for them. And we would talk about these kind of taxonomic information structures that have always been there, that have always been functional. And we would say, you know what, we'll do your interviews for your research as long as you do yours with us. And they would say, oh, we don't have funding for that. And then they would say, oh, you mean we're getting paid for this? And they say, oh, no, 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 sorry. Myself and my dissertation share and my tuition, that's what I'm funding. So not only are they not being compensated for their time, they're being told that it has to be decontextualized and run through this meat grinder and then used to prove someone else's idea somewhere else. And at the end, they would always give us a nice three-ring binder. We used to have a wall called the Mighty Collection of Three-Ring Binders. And not one victory song could be sang for any of them, because they mean nothing to us. Nothing. Well, we hired ourselves to do a project where we said, let's get the old ladies to break the families down and do this. And now this is one of those posters that's in every house. There's a series of about eight posters Family names, how they're different by if you're male or female. The one that all the different places in your house, starting with your place setting at your kitchen table, and then all the things in your kitchen where you prepare food, and then everything in your house. Next order of magnitude is in the community, and beyond that is what you see around you. This is, what's ha this is what happens when your community is allowed to say, our way of understanding is valid. Our, our way of doing this is something that's real. It's not a fake thing, and it's not a just do it because it's quaint. It's not something that you should be here to do in the introduction of your research to make it sound like it's this really kind of goofy thing that now we're gonna give you the real Western scientific way. 
it in and of itself is a functional system. So if epistemology is how we take all those things and we pass them on, then anti-epistemology is the breaking down of it. And this is the part that's always really heavy. Um, George Tinker, who wrote about deep structures, would say the way you colonize a group is you just take over their deep structures and you force them to change. We've all seen the iceberg model of culture where there's surface things like our clothes and our age and things you see about the food that I eat. And then further down there are other things that are harder to see. Subtle body language, understanding relationship with power and authority, um, sense of self, sense of purpose, trust. Then you go even further down. The further down you go, those are the deep structures. Those surface structures are fairly easy to change, especially when you're first meeting someone. God, I really didn't like how close that guy was to me, but I understand he's from somewhere else. And so, you know, he didn't mean anything by it. It's just, you know, I'm a little bit weird about that. So, okay, I can change that and I can have a conversation with you standing really close. If part of my identity fundamentally has the way to do with the way that I understand truth in this world, because it has to have come across generations to get to me, and that has suddenly changed because you're now in a school where men and women who by definition cannot have their own children are your parents responsible for teaching you everything about responsibility, the truth and ethical behavior and understanding your body and human sexuality and relationships, you're in trouble. And if you do that across generations, you're even in more trouble. And if you do that for 150 years, that's a fundamentally genocidal process. A conversion of the heart um, this one is Peterson and Pierce that wrote a book and said it wasn't enough to change the way that we thought. You wanted to change the way we felt. And remember what I said about learning? The residential school system was never about academics. Our kids did not learn math and reading and writing. They learned animal husbandry. They learned how to pray. And they weren't even given the Bible. They were given these really little books that were these really, really pro-Canadian, very watered down, just the basics of the Bible. I remember doing interviews in St. Eugene's with elders and saying, you know, how often did you have to read the Bible? And they said, they never gave us the Bible because the Bible tells you to be a good person and not break people down and not hate them, and not try and change the way that they feel fundamentally. And I was blown away by that. I was just blown away by it. They wanted to change the way that we felt. Soul damaging, soul wounding, crushing individual energies, and the most important, depleting the collective immune system of indigenous communities. How we preserve our identity across space and time. How we reach sense of purpose, sense of identity, sense of belonging. You just break those things down. If you want to kill a people, you just steal the kids. And you do it for a couple of generations and you will kill them. There's nothing left. Uh, I'll maybe not focus too much on that one. This is what it looked like. The men are gone. There are no men in the pictures during this period. This is probably, this is probably World War II uh, to 1960. The men are gone. The women are holding their babies. Women are hiding in the lodge with their kids while the priest stands over all of them, standing over the women, standing over the kids, standing, replacing the men. Things are going horrifically wrong here. There's no, nobody in this, and this is kind of a, a stylized version of this picture, but nobody is smiling in this picture. The smiles are gone. There's no little girl that feels comfortable even stealing a berry or an apple because she feels loved and cared for. It, it's, it's gone. Kids are no longer sitting in a circle praying and asking for help for one another. There's a wonderful property of a circle. But if you sit into a, in a circle up to about 175 people, you can make eye contact with each and every person. It's harder to lie to someone because they can see your body language. If you genuinely are asking for help and you're sitting in a circle, making yourself vulnerable, look at me, understand that I'm hurting. This is my body language. This is who I am. There's this thing that happens in human communities up to about 175 people. There was this really famous study, it was um, Gore-Tex and then a division of 3M. When their divisions would get to 175 people, they would, 150 people, they'd split them in half into 275 person groups. 
because they wanted everyone to remember the details. I remember you have a son and you have a daughter and your daughter's a year older than my daughter who's a year younger than you. You remember those details in a functional group. When you line people up and put them in a grid and you make them start praying to something on the wall where they can't see one another, where they can't make eye contact, where they can't ask for help, where they can no longer tell if they're being deceived, that's horrific. If you want to brainwash a group, you just stop letting them look at the people they're asking for help. It's a picture um, from the Carlisle School. This was Pratt who coined the term, kill the Indian, save the child, kill the Indian, save the Christian. There's like a thousand kids in this picture. It's a pretty famous picture. Not one of them is smiling. I have a daughter and getting her and even one friend to do the same thing during a picture is almost impossible. You add kids to that number and it's exponentially more difficult. There's a thousand kids here that are all fundamentally broken. And they're not smiling because somebody told them, hey, everybody, do the opposite of smile. They look that way because They've been taken a thousand miles from their home and raised by people that can't have children of their own. Nothing makes sense to them anymore. Everything is gone. Everything is different. And there are still people that think that it didn't happen. I still work with Canadians today that are like, ah, oh, it wasn't really that bad, was it? These are not the handcuffs for the parents. These are the handcuffs for the kids that would run away middle of the night, a foot of snow, to get away, to try and get home. I used to work with one of the men in our community who said it was like a game. I would just leave and I would try and get home. And first the priest knew where I would cross and I would get to Wardner and he would be there and he would know. And then after I found out how to cross in other areas, he would be at the next step. And it finally got to the point where I could make it home but it didn't matter because as soon as I got there, he was at my house and my parents would tell me, you have to go back. That was one of those crazy stories that I heard and uh, I, I understood. I understood why my grandparents left. For all the things I was mad about my whole life, why don't I have a dad? Why don't I have a grandfather? Why don't I have these tools? Why is my problem solving toolbox all busted up and I'm using tools from a hundred years ago to solve problems today? I understood at that point. It's crazy. Nothing, nothing makes sense. Everything is, up, uh, everything is upside down. But the really nice thing, about this time I was taking my doctoral studies, I took a really great course that was on um, conversation and dialogue. It was called something like leadership and dialogue. I later um, got to work on a course that's similar uh, with some of my doctoral students in leadership, dialogue, and empathy. And there's this great idea where people said, really, antipistemology is an undoing someone's way of learning. Antipistemology, from a discourse perspective, is the ability, it's, a, it's having a process of refining your knowledge of someone. If I think I know who you are because of the way you're dressed or because you're at this conference or because you've told me you come from one community or another, the more I talk to you, the more I unlearn that. Because that schema, that blueprint I have in my head of maybe what clothing you're wearing or what logos of sports teams or what car you drive, I have a conversation with you and I'm constantly, as long as I'm open to it, I'm updating what I know about you. And it, it's recursive, it's both ways. The more we talk, there was a couple of, of bloggers here that were talking about, hey, and the more we started talking, they were like, oh, actually we did an episode on this. And then actually we did one on, there's all these similar backgrounds. It's that constant state uh, of unlearning what you know about someone. Um, it's a way of uh, unlearning the perceived perceptions um, but more importantly, it's engaging in when you, sorry, this is a little, I, I transferred from PowerPoint to Keynote, so I, so I switched this one up a little bit. And I just jumped forward three slides. If I close your eyes. Okay. Um, and engaging in true conversations means we don't exist individually, but we exist relationally. You're not just a dot on a map anymore, and I'm a network theorist, so I'm all about nodes and edges and links and clusters and low geodesics and all of these small worlds kinds of things. We're no longer dots on the map. We're having a conversation, and we're unlearning about each other, and we're updating what we know. We are now relational. I'll never be the same because of all the people that are here that I've talked to or had this interaction with. We'll never just be two random disconnected dots. 
A similar project we did in the area was with one of the uh, uh, one of the uh, adventure tourism lodges, and we came and we did a project like like that with them. And now every time I come to Nelson, they know, and we have breakfast. I got to have breakfast with them today. They're not just dots that left after that, and I never see them again. We exist relationally. We have this conversation. They know that I'm a snowboarder, and they're skiers, and we hang out and we talk about the. We exist in this relationship. What that looks like for us, after our voice went away, after our ability to share those problems and pass that information on, after it went away, we had a discussion. When we first started talking about reconciliation, I asked our elders, what does it mean? And they said, well, it's not talking. For us, talking literally, our word for talking, like when we translate it to English, literally just means I'm making noise at you. They would say that um, for us, means we're thinking about it together. Our word for one is that thing I said about heart. Thinking together. So for us, reconciliation is about going from being all these forced little individuals solving problems or maybe some pairwise groups solving problems to solving problems together again and we broke it down and we went around the circle and they said the way that we would communicate is really the way we only see in our ceremonies today you sit in a circle you make eye contact with one another nobody ever cuts anyone else off each person, you don't have to say something, but if you do and you start talking and I'm in the circle with you, I wait till you're done and then I leave a big awkward pause at the end so you know I'm never going to cut you off. And what happens in the Western world when there's an awkward pause? You want to fill it. You want to cover it up. You want to be epistemically violent and stomp your way in like Godzilla. And every researcher that's come to our community has done that. How would you say this? Oh, you don't know. Let me tell you this anecdote. You can't, you have to ask them and sometimes wait a long time. And then when they start talking about it, you wait a long time so you know that they're done. After that person talks, the next person can say one of two things. I appreciate what you said because that's the way my family sees it and that's in line with what I've learned. That tells me something about us. Or, that's really interesting, I didn't know that. My family did it a little bit different and there's two ways of doing it. And that tells us something important. I'm not gonna make you see it my way. There's some difference. And the reason there's a difference is an important cultural learning. And you go around the problem and you solve, you, you can solve any problem with any group of problem solvers that are caring about their community, that are trying to fix these things. So for me, it's Chinese food, because Chinese food in the States is not as good. Um, Chinese food in Nelson and Castle Bar and Cranbrook, it's the way to go. I can tell you that I don't eat Chinese food in the States at all. And everybody knows you go to Lucky Star with Christopher because Aiko and her family know that I'm going to bring people in for research. There's a table at the front. If I've got up to five people, that's our table. And we sit there and they will let us talk as long as we want. And she will bring and refill water or coffee or tea for as long as we want to be there for five hours. She knows we're working together. She knows that's what we're doing. On this particular day, I called her and said, Aiko, I've got 20 people. She says, okay, by the time you're here, I'll clear everyone out of that half of the restaurant and we'll line all the tables up. This is what we did. We decided after we said, look, if our community communicates differently and solves a problem, let's go and do it. And I said, let's start with the meal. So we went and it, one of my aunties looks really mad in here, but she was laughing really hard. My dad's in here, Pete, he's just laughing away, Chinese food there. It was this really beautiful thing because for the first time we said, we don't have to talk. We don't have to do research. We're gonna go and communicate the way we would have in such a way that we're working on it together. So everybody gets their information, their premises to the argument, their parts, their experience is a part of the conversation. So as you move forward, nobody is left out. So everyone has had a chance to say, this is what I'm concerned about. And we won't move forward until we've addressed that and everybody hears it. So we were done here and they said, one of the old guys says, oh, we better head out into the field and this is where it gets scary because <laughs> it could go horribly wrong. Um, so the experiment was, I'm a complexity theorist, which is about understanding what happens in a network when there's not a set of rules to say what should happen. 
So uh, my cousin, Don Sand, who's the director of the Traditional Knowledge and Language Program, he said, well, what, what's the plan? And I said, there is no plan. And he says, well, what do you mean there's no plan? We've got elders. We've got to have a plan. And I said, we're going to do what our community's been doing since the beginning of time. And if you trust me, we'll see that it happens. And he says, oh, I know what you're doing now. Because they all know, everyone in my community knows at the point where someone's figured out um, what the uh, uh, what the treatment and the experiment is and what I'm looking to see how people do. So we go out there. And um, uh, Chief Sophie Pierre, uh, who's my relative uh, and who recently has joined me in working on a couple of uh, uh, SHRC and uh, Canadian Institutes of Health Research uh, proposals, um, I, I told Sophie she had just retired and I said, Auntie, if you come out and you just go to one of these sites and you start talking, I think you'll see something really beautiful happen. And she says, I'm not always comfortable with that because in my way of thinking, it should be my mother here. And 20 years ago, when I started working there, it was her mother. And I said, everyone in this group is in the same position. And I know you know about leadership in a Western sense, in a policy sense, in an economic development sense, in a language sense, in a cultural sense. I just need you to go start talking. So she sits down on a chair, and lo and behold, a couple of the old women come and sit with her. And when I say old women, I don't mean that in a derogatory way. The old women, that's who carries the culture for us. It doesn't matter how many people are involved until the old women show up and they have that old school mentality to interject those old, deep philosophical structures. It's not really a what have been. So um, my auntie here looking at the sun is uh, Laura McCoy. She's been a part of just about every experiment I've done since the beginning of my studies. And then Mary Basil, who now, she's the woman that's, I don't know why Mary's facing the other direction. Later on, we look at the pictures and Mary said, oh, gee, darn it, I'm facing the wrong direction. <laughs> I said, oh, Mary, we'll Photoshop it and we'll turn you around somehow. <laughs> um, Mary's another one of those women that forever would say, I don't really have a voice here because I don't think I'm the one that should be here. And we told her, Mary, you're that person from your family. And if you don't share that with us, your family is not a part. And that's not the way we solve problems. And now Mary is one of those people that is in every one of these problem solving meetings. And sure enough, a couple minutes later, everybody circles up. They start getting in their little chairs, their little $10 or Walmart chairs that everyone complains about are uncomfortable, but this is what they get to take to powwows. <laughs> so everybody's got their chairs out of their cars. You know, we didn't even tell anyone let's bring chair. This spontaneous thing is happening. We never told everybody, let's circle up and talk about the culture. But one person tells a story, and it had to do, let's see if I can find it. Yeah, it had to do with, there's an interpretive sign here at Fort Steele. And one person started talking about it, and then the next person started talking about it. And then there were details that were left out of the story that had to go with that sign. So the next person told what they knew about it. And then the next person said, well, the reason it wasn't included, because at that time, we didn't have ownership of our own cultural materials. We were told if we gave this to someone that it didn't belong to us. So now they're talking about how they could redo the sign and have Nation Council logo branding so that we could add this other layer that had never been there. They're thinking together. Who can this way to? There's one heart. They're talking, but it's one heart. It's one thing. So then we go to St. Mary's Lake. St. Mary's Lake is a place where there was one of our contemporary um, land claims where people were talking about how to move forward and they were talking about mitigating some circumstances for something that had happened and they were working on, and they worked for a long time on this idea that they would receive certain lands up at St. Mary's Lake. And it ended up falling apart. And when it fell apart, the industry partners left all of the things right where they were. They never got cleaned up and died on the vine. Now you go there and if you go voting up there, you know there's lots of structures in the water that if you get with your boat, you're gonna have a really large insurance claim. You have a boat and I know what happens when you hit something with your prop. You bend all of those really fancy brass pieces. So we go up and we sit down, same thing. We didn't tell anyone anything. In fact, some of us got lost. I was lost on the other side of the lake. Uh, technically, I was looking for someone else, but I was still pretty lost. So we all arrived there over the course of about 40 minutes. And Every, and we had picked up another car by this point, which was really neat. But everybody started to say, we found a place where we could sit and the logs were part of the chairs and we got, and we all had lunch. 
and everybody did. In our community, eating is an important thing. You're solving problems together, it starts with a meal. Everybody's laughing, everybody was having their meal. And when the last person was done eating, they started around, started with Sophie talking about that land claim. And then the next person said, I remember when that happened, here's the detail about it. And the next person would say, oh yeah, I didn't really ever know the specifics. They go around that circle. And it's a really emotional thing because you're not used to seeing this. My doctoral research was, is there enough cultural DNA left to grow this little petri dish of a culture? Because I know what happens when you take a collectively traumatized system and then you put weight on it. And it's not triangulated and there aren't complex structures and there aren't small worlds and low ge geodesics, it falls apart. Those networks tear themselves apart from the inside out. And here we were doing it. And I didn't tell anyone we were gonna do it. I said, well, how did we solve problems? And then we just went out and I let everybody get out of their car and do their own thing and go their own way. Now, one of the pictures that I, oh, here's the background you can see, here's part of the, this was not supposed to be there. This was industry stuff that got left there because they moved logs down. So they had all these really finely, they're just these refined and nuanced things that nobody knows about where people would go hunting and they point out people's trap lines. And this was actually cutting through here, if this picture continues on, this was our way to get here. We cross over and then we come out right over here. Now this is just north of Akam and just south of Akisimok. And then they were like, and this is where your grandfather would go. When they were going to Kumi, like this is the easiest way to go over because it's a lower pass. And then they started talking about where they know people were buried. Because in those days, when someone passed away, you buried them where they were. But you buried them a specific way. So you could tell that the way their body was there, who it was, if it was someone from your community. But you couldn't, we didn't have nurses. We couldn't carry them with us. So we're getting all of this information freely flowing in a problem-solving network, existing relationally, building these strengths, building these um, redundancies. So if I were to drop out of that network, everyone else there heard it. And it's healthy information because it doesn't go away if one person misremembers it, or one person is a little bit off of what they remember, or one person passes away, because it happens all the time. It's not all vested in one person. It gets decentralized, uh, it gets uh, given. I also record it as well, because I'm a, one of those big tech guys. I want everything recorded. I want it duplicated. I want it a set that's stored off-site in a fireproof safe out of my studio, so if something happens, People didn't think like that for a long time, and, and now we do, and now it's kind of interwoven into this um, kind of process. So here's Sophie, and so I don't know why I tease my cousin about that. Dawn is actually sitting in a chair, and I don't know why. I think what happened is we got there, and the old lady said, oh, we've been in a car all day, we're going to stand up, but it almost looks like Dawn gets the chair, and all those other women have to stand. I, I don't remember exactly what happened, but at the end of the day, someone said, hey, you know, before we go back to the office, Let's go get some cattail roots that we can pound into flour, because not everyone knows how to do that. Um, of course, when our diet changed 100 or so years ago, almost overnight, we went from having um, very fructose-heavy foods, very um, fibrous, very high-protein foods, to uh, you know, enriched white flour and shortening, everything was short. Fry bread is not traditional food, and it's not healthy. Um, I was driving crazy because of the power. I was like, oh, we're going to do fry bread and chili. And I was like, oh, oh, <laughs> really, fry bread? <laughs> um, but we have this way of taking the cat. Traditionally, we made flour by taking the cattail root and drying it and then mortar and pestling it and grinding it up really fine. And, and then you could use that and you could make a kind of a bread that we use. And there are people now that use that when they make fry bread so that there's a little bit more of a fiber content. So we're out there, and, I, and I've seen the story before. These people had it, so they're all going through and they're talking. And I was asked um, by the, actually the, uh, the chief that's up at Ainsworth right now, he said, hey, we have this new sweat house going up and we need, um, we need those mats on the floor so they're not so dusty. And that's a really traditional building material from this area. And I said, okay, while everyone's doing their thing, I'll try and steal some. So, because we're down on like railway land and they were like, Oh, comes up, we all got to get in the vehicles. And that was when they all were just like, I'm not going. If they show up, I'm going to show them my saddle car, and I'm going to, and I was thinking, oh, oh, this is when Don says, hey, things should go bad. It's usually because there's an argument. 
We one time tried to bring elders across the border at point uh, at uh, what is it? Uh, Port of Pigan Crossing in Mount Shell was really argumentative. He kept saying, I'm going to try and get in using my Safeway Club card. <laughs> <laughs> he was led into the country, and I was, I was, I couldn't go up there, um, but they made all the elders go up, and then they, they were told that then later that he did show up at a real piece of identification that did not have a Safeway logo on it. But so we're there, and I go down, and I'm, I'm kind of, you know, I can't see what's going on, but some, and that was the other thing that someone said, oh, be really careful because there's a lot of bear down there. And I was like, all right, well, that's pretty good. So down there, and I've got my little leatherman with my little one and a half, two inch blade, and I'm cutting away, and I hear something, and I panic because I was sure it was a bear, and I was going to defend myself with my little leatherman. And I turn around, and what I see is Hazel Pascal, who's an elder from my community, doing what Hazel Pascal, as a young girl, had seen that she learned from her parents, that her parents learned from their parents and their parents and so on and so forth. And I turn around and she looks at me and she says, I just want to carry them to the bank. Almost like asking if it was okay. And I didn't know what to say because that's one of those, when your culture has been taken away, dispossessed, disrespected, and twisted around, and what do you say? What, what do you say? And I was like, oh, I'm, I'm really happy. I'm really happy. <laughs> That sounds like, you know, I'm really happy that I don't have to do it. Anyway, she kind of smiles and she carries them and she brings them to the bottom of the bank where the next person walks down and carries them to the top of the bank. And the next person carries them to the top of the bank to the truck. And it's really hard to talk about because we haven't done this for a long time. And the last person at the truck that loaded them in was my father, who recently moved back and didn't know anything about anything. He had to start off as a 40, 50 year old young person who's the anchor on this team. And I show up down in Lower Kootenai and I've got this hole and I told them the story and they were like, "Dang, that's really good. It's nowhere near enough. I like your story. <laughs> so this really amazing thing happened. And over the last two years, my job has been get the people together, and get them to think about how do we move forward. If it takes complexity leadership theory or negative entropy leadership theory, or if it takes connective leadership theory, if whatever it takes, find some way to bring people together and build them up so that they're doing it in such a way that they're not tearing one another down, that they're not, they're not being disrespected, they're not disrespecting other people, that they're doing these traditional things that they're doing these things that we should have been allowed to do since the beginning of time because those were given to us and those sacred stories and talk to our parents and their parents and their grandparents in those songs. That's what it means to be gunaha. That's what it means to be a human being for us. That's what it means. Today, in the last year, I'm going to talk about a few kind of, and I don't know where I am for time, because I can't see, I actually can't see a clock. I've been um, surreptitiously looking for a clock. 10 minutes? Okay. Um, so in the last recent while, we've been working really hard on getting our community members into um, institutions to be a part of curriculum design. If you're going to indigenize, like every institution wants to indigenize, it's the, it's the hot button topic right now then you have to bring us in you can't indigenize without us you're just wasting our time you're wasting our resources if you're trying that canoe that's painted up there in the wrong style it's great it means well it's great you missed the mark just a little bit because i guarantee you there was no one from our community there i just absolutely know that they weren't because they would have looked at that and said oh no 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 come on pull close that's Kalispell tribe from Sandpoint. That's not a sturgeon. That's not the way the nose is. It doesn't work like that. College of the Rockies here, they have a wild plant display. And it was really nice because our community, my community, Kiskanook uh, First Nation came down to do uh, watching the video and do a little training. So we got to walk them through the, the kind of the center of the complex. There's this wild plant display and it's all in Kunaha with interpretive signage that our community helped to come up with. And it's really great. So everybody's 
you know, we figured, oh, we'll take a couple minutes, and about 10 minutes, and everyone's talking about plants and stories. Then the sprinklers came on, and everybody had to try and run in, because <laughs> they did not know that there would be sprinklers. Um, Ainsworth, Lower Kootenai Band has a chief who, not, I'm a little bit biased, I'm the right hand of the, you know, if you watch Game of Thrones, and there's the hand of the king, or the hand of the, I'm the hand of the chief of the Lower Kootenai Band. It's an official leadership position that we've always had. I'm the right hand of the chief of the Lower Kootenai Band. And he will occasionally get a hold of me and say, the community is thinking about making an investment. And they don't make investments in things like banks and securities. And they don't make investments in things um, that you might find in more urban settings. They say, we are going to engage in a new leasing system with our agricultural lands. They got put in the worst swamp lands that were, but guess what happens when you dry those swamps out? You get the best agricultural soils. And then they tried to take those from the band, and the band was like, whoa, you thought this was worthless. We always knew it's worthless. So now they gather traditional materials and they lease some of it out to some of the agricultural producers. They invest in businesses that build community. They engage in land claims where they increase the band's holdings in valuable areas so they can develop interpretive materials. So they can put in boat launches and have some kind of a say over this is what's going to happen. They got a hold of me at one point and said, we're thinking about buying Ainsworth. And I said, the hot springs? And they said, the entire resort. And I was like, yeah, that's, I, I, I like it. And I said, can you come up and you know, we'll do a little strategizing. We, we, we've been meeting with them for a while, but we want to make sure we don't change it overnight. We want to keep what works. That's that culture, right? Whatever's working needs to stay because it's working and what can be done better. We want to have our voice be a part of that discussion and this kind of tourism, recreation, rural setting. If it works, leave it. And if it needs to be changed, we want our voice to be a part of that. And I said, hey, man, I'm all for this. My wife has been up there before I ever met her. And I remember the one thing she said was, God, that's really good. They should remodel the restaurant because she had even remembered it was a very kind of 70s style restaurant. So the first time I'm talking to him, he says, yeah, we're, we're redoing the restaurant. If you go, go up to the Kronacha Grill, that's what it's called, Go and meet the chef, who's a world-class chef, and have anything, just a snack. You, they have this little, they have a couple of um, locally made sorbet desserts, it's a little sampler. They have a salad that uses watermelon radishes. It's the most amazing. They, it's, all, it's all infused with local, food, local foods. You can get dishes made with local meats, with local fish. That's the way you do it. That's how you have a voice after your voice goes away. That's how you get involved with planning. You don't start thinking about what you can buy to sell and make a profit, or what you can buy and put a casino in so that everyone can get checks. When you decide that you wanna be a part of building up relationships, you do that. And the nice thing is, Selkirk goes there all, their adventure tourism program, we go and work with them there. Um, the Retallic Lodge, we had, they brought their entire staff in and they said, we want to hang out and we want to be involved and we want your community to have a say in making some of our runs. And they know I was a snowboarder. And they said, we'll bring you hella skiing. And I was like, I'm, I'm, sounds good. <laughs> I'll give you whatever name you want because that's a really awesome thing. Um, they, they know that Jason mountain bikes and they have like this crazy mountain bike system and Jason kept saying, oh, okay. And they kept asking him and I was like, Jason's not that kind of mountain biker. He's like a highway old man mountain biker staying shape and said, but that's okay too. <laughs> um, so to be able to go up and do those kinds of work, um, this is another event. This is Jason, this is the chief. He's up there right now with Clarence Louie and some other leadership from around the province. And then our elder, Ann Jimmy. Ann's mother was one of those first elder women that pulled me aside and said, I knew your grandmother. I'm stepping out of the way so everyone can see their picture. And really important to me. She's one of the strongest educators talking about her experience in the residential school because she's been through it and she's figured it out and she's decided how she's gonna move ahead to let go of what hurt her and move forward. And I get to teach with Anne and I have pictures of me with her mother and now I get to have pictures of me with Anne. And this is one of those Instagram pictures. I got like nine likes and my daughter posts a selfie and it's like 300. 
Um, the, our word for those hot springs is nubik awu'u. Nubik awu'u. I want everybody to make sure they can see that picture. What that means for us is spirit water. We would go in those caves and sit in that water to medicine up our bodies. And when they said, hey, we're redoing part of that area down there with signage, what should we do? They brought it back to the community and they asked the elders and they said, there's only one name we would have ever called it. And now I get to go there with him and I get to sit in those hot springs. We went in and we sang. And then we went in and recorded. He went and he had asked for an umbrella and they were like, uh, it's not a claim. Like, we just need an umbrella. We can't. So sure enough, we're going back with the umbrella and then we sing. And it's one of the most beautiful things I've ever heard because I have a recording studio and I know what you can do with digital reverb. But what you can do when it sounds like you're in a cave with rain and you have three voices singing together with one heart, it's pretty beautiful. It's a pretty incredible thing. Um, so this is people from Selkirk with Ann and, and Jason and I. Um, Aboriginal, uh, at the, the gathering place at uh, Selkirk College is also an Aboriginal gathering place at College of the Rockies. When we can do events there and work with people, we just love it. It's just a beautiful thing. Go there. You sing, you see what's going on, you get people sharing, you get people talking, you get people exchanging those ideas, solving problems as one heart. This was our first intensive Kunaha language workshop right up the road in Kaslo. It was pretty awesome because it was Anne and I and Anne's granddaughter. So I got to see Anne and not her daughter, but her granddaughter working on language. But we saw 25 people that aren't indigenous at all that wanted to know about our language and culture. And we got to do this great two-day workshop where we worked on mostly pronunciation and some basics of how our grammar is different. So when someone comes to us and says, what's the name for so-and-so? It never works like that. It's this different morphological process of breaking words down and building them back differently. There's the signing of the MOU with Selkirk College uh, with the Nation Council uh, and one of our bands getting people together and saying, if we're going to do it, we're going to do it together. We're no longer going to make the decisions and include your voice as an afterthought. You're no longer just guest speakers that we give $50 in the coffee mug even though you drove for four hours to be here. We'll pay you for your time. We'll bring your people in. I mean, people are laughing when you hear that. But the number of times that I've shown up to something and then it's like a hearted handshake and thanks to the you know, grateful workshop. It, it's like that. Now we have these kinds of relationships where people will say, we'll figure out some way to do it. We've got these MOUs, we've got these agreements. Now, my last couple of slides, because about technology. We started, we coded a social network that looked a lot like Facebook and sounded a lot like Facebook. And it was really a lot like Facebook. because That's what I based it off of. And you could have a profile and you could send friend requests and you could post pictures and you could send messages. Page number one says, this is an online community for the development of language resources. And if you get a profile, it means that you are agreeing to add to the life breath of the Kunaha language. There'll be no arguing, there'll be no trolling, there'll be no bullying, there'll be none of that. And we got a couple hundred people that did some really incredible things. Most of them, and one of the, my one auntie who looks mad in all the pictures, one day comes up to me and she says, I was presenting about it, she said, I just want you to know, I just, I got my profile just so I could steal the font. I don't even go on anymore, but I've got the font now, so I hope that's good enough. And I was like, yeah, that's, that's more than I would have ever expected, so at least you have the font. Um, we, uh, if you come to the Columbia Basin Symposium that's coming up, I'm going to be presenting specifically on technology and language, bringing in our rapid prototyper to build some toys. Because if you want to build toys in your language and make it, you know, uh, economically feasible, you have to contact someone in China and build like 50,000 units. <clears throat> well, I don't have that kind of money, but I'm happy to buy a $500 printer, and I got a really good one for the XYZ printers are really good for 500. And we just started building toys and putting words on them, uh, raising the words. Uh, some of our curriculum developers said, hey, you should have, um, it should be high contrast, low impact. Make a toy, put a word on it, raise the text of the word and make it a different color. Kids tend to remember things better than if you stand above them and keep yelling the name of the word. 
But what we found is we went to a workshop where we were showing all the elders and all our language speakers these toys. So we passed these toys and these little magnets around. And they start going around. And it was, again, Christopher's off in the corner watching and he's recording it because he's a complexity theorist. And my theory was someone would open the toys and start playing with them. And these were adults. Lo and behold, halfway through, one of my cousins opens them up. And the word they had a, 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 was a horse that said, which is our word for horse. And sure enough, he was spelling it with the letters. So I took pictures, and there's a funny picture of some of it somewhere where he's trying to not let me see he's playing with the toys. Uh, but it was pretty cool. We waited for iOS to allow developers to change the default keyboard uh, since forever. And when iOS 8 came out, they allowed the development of soft keys. You might have, you might have swipe, which is the more popular one. Um, we, my dad called me that day and said, it's up, it's gone, let's do it. About a week later, we were out the testing. Um, and if you wanna to go to the App Store or you go to uh, the Play Store and you look for my name, all the apps are on there and all the Gunaka ones are free because the Nation Council said, the chances that our language will be used more, which means that it increases the chances that our language will be spoken other generation is much greater if we do this for free and let anyone ever anywhere have it. And um, there's some really nice, and they're all unicorn. So you can post and tweet and text, um, and it shows up correctly on any browser, uh, across platform, across any phone. I can text someone with a Samsung phone, and the correct international phonetic alphabet symbols show up because we do enough to use the tools that are there because some things work. And the things that don't work, we find some way to modify them. We get everybody communicating from the beginning. And at the end, we have a product that people will use and not argue with. This is actually the Muckleshoot keyboard because as soon as ours was up, all kinds of groups said, hey, we would really like to have a keyboard customized for our community. Um, so we worked a lot with Muckleshoot. They have a lot, they have a lot of really fun apps. They have one of those games where it's a bunch of cards and you click one and it turns over and says the name of the animal and then you click a second one and it says the name and if it's not the same it tells you in their language you need to try again and if it's correct it says something like hey you did it it's, it's we, we had one we did this one we did the jigsaw puzzle and everyone was like nobody's going to care about the jigsaw puzzle so we brought the ipad in and i dropped it off i left it at the front desk at the office the receptionist started playing with it and of course, complexity theorists, I'm following it around the building to see who does what. And about a dozen adults all picked it up. But the interesting thing, they did every one of, I think there's eight puzzles. They did every one of them before they handed it to the next person. There's something incredible about those deep structures. You know that little game when you were a kid, had like 16 squares and one was missing and you could move one piece at one time. To, to me, all those were ever good for was if you're a statistician and you need, you need to explain degrees of freedom, you have 16 squares, you have one open square, you can move one piece at a time, that's one degree of freedom. Well, we did a game where you saw pictures in our language with the word and you had to figure out what it was. And we released it. And on the, angry, on the language group, a couple of the 20-somethings were really talking smack about it. Whatever, I'm not a little kid. This is like... Why aren't we spending money on an important language stuff? And I was a little bit upset, but I said, you know what? Let's just see where it goes. Complexity theory. Through this chaotic distribution, let's see what emerges. The edge of chaos, wait overnight, I log on. The next day, she is competing with her sisters. I got the, I got the, uh, I got the eight by eight done in this many moves. I got it done in this many moves. Going through the process of collective trauma, your trust structures are violated. And it's not, like a, it's not like a natural disaster because someone had to make a decision to destroy your trust structures. So you always are a little bit worried about the next program, the next researcher. You're always worried about the next curriculum, the next grant. Someone always wants to take something from you. You never go around the circle and get your voice in early. So when budgets run out or when there's disagreements between groups, it's always the indigenous people that ended up getting kind of booted off those projects. It's your natural reaction. You have a collective hypervigilance. I have a book on Amazon, and if you like the Kindle reader, you can get it for like $2, it's basically free. I think I get like eight cents for everyone that sells. 
But if you're really interested in knowing what happens to the trust structures and um, communities, um, Jewish and Yiddish speaking communities post Holocaust, um, African American communities in the American South post slavery, um, post, uh, um, post what was at the time called post lower class, post industrial school communities in Ireland, post residential schools in Canada, when people have trouble moving forward and using their voice and collaborating and thinking together, that's where those, those, those kind of collective symptoms are on there. But they all have to do with this collective hypervigilance. I know you're saying this is good for me, but the last time we did it, this is what we lost. This is what was taken. This is how we were told we didn't have a voice. We never saw it again. Nobody cared. I never got my $50 in my coffee mug. To be able to be a part of workshops like this, to be able to be industry partners uh, in everything from tourism to agriculture, um, to land tenure programs, uh, to be able to be a part of community art, community museums, community problem solving, knowing that in 2017, if you wanna really be a part of reconciliation, it means having a conversation with us relationally from the beginning where you're not telling us what words we have to use and you're open to hearing words that you might not be used to hearing and you let us go around and you let us say what we have to say without cutting us off or telling we're wrong or translating it for us then all of that information gets into that problem solving network there's a policy framework that overlaps with complexity theory called collaboratively rational frameworks and it says if you don't get everyone's ideas in from the beginning, it's going to fall apart when the pressure on that policy network increases. It's happened a million times, it'll happen a million more. If you don't build people in and understand that we don't all talk the same way, we don't all have the same body language, we don't share things the same way, some things might be appropriate in one setting but aren't in others. If you're willing to let people stop and think about, think about for somebody whose first language was Gunaka, but learned English and then had English beaten into them and Gunaka beaten out of them. And now they're trying to learn Gunaka again and you're having a conversation with them and they're going through the process of translating everything that you're saying so it makes sense to them. It's slow and it's mechanical and if you study second language acquisition, you know that it's Krashen's kind of uh, monitor over users. That's why a lot of times when I speak Gunaka, I'm a monitor over user because I'm having to learn that as an adult. If you don't allow me to do that, you're basically saying there's one way to do it. And it's what Western science and um, centralized English and English only administrations accept and everything else is not acceptable. So if you're talking with me, when I do this, I'm not telling you to wait because what you're saying is wrong or not important, or I'm telling you putting some boundary. I'm telling you that I'm trying to rearrange in my head something that doesn't make sense. Because for four generations, every young person who heard that just had a bulldozer through their brain. Forget everything you know, do it this way. Now we're trying to move backwards. If you can make it to Ainsworth tomorrow, you definitely should. If we would have known earlier, I would have tried to have another day or set something up and go and be there and do a little tour or something. And I didn't really know. Um, you know, maybe in the future or some, something worth doing. If you're driving back and you're going east, go to Cranbrook and go to the Powell tomorrow. I don't have an idea. I have a fried bread and chili. <laughs> Wherever it is that you came from here today, from another part of the world or another part of this country or another part of this valley, you can go home and have a conversation with someone. It's an indigenous voice that should be echoing around out of every mountain and in every cave since forever. Have that conversation, be a part of it, and allow people to use the words that make sense to them. If it's a hard thing to talk about. If I've offended anyone, sometimes I use you know, humor to kind of, um, you know, uh, kind of de-escalate because I study resilient systems, and I know that that's what you do. Um, if I hurt anyone's feelings or I made you feel uncomfortable, I apologize, but sometimes you just got to hear it. Um, and uh, on behalf of myself and my family and my community, um, I'm I'm very humbled to be asked to come here and have this conversation and, uh, and take up you know, an hour and a half of your time. Uh, and I thank you for listening to me. So with that, I will say, ah, thank you. Hey. <laughs>